Uh, oh, sorry, I'm like ready to kick music. Here we go. Three, two. Trey Radel, your host of The Drive here. Um, you know, every time that Republicans propose a policy or want to disassemble uh, a Democrat policy, liberal policies, uh, people die. I mean, just ask. Uh, Obamacare was the prime one. You know, if, if you do this to Obamacare, people are going to die. Uh, if you implement net neutrality, if you take it away from the people after the Democrats implemented it, people are going to die. Uh, Jonathan Cannon with the R Street Institute joining us now. Uh, they promote free markets, real solutions. It's a think tank that they say for the modern age. Actually, I love this institute. We've had uh, someone who you might remember her, Shoshana, on before. Uh, and Jonathan joins us uh, today on net neutrality. Um, Jonathan, we'll get into what net neutrality is. Uh, is and what it's about it hasn't been around are lots of people dying uh not that i've heard of good. Not from the internet <laughs> we are we're um, off to a good start jonathan so so first give us just kind of um a, a lowdown here on this policy uh, what net neutrality is and why uh, people want to implement this policy yeah so the the term net neutrality came about uh in the early 2000s um, by a guy called Tim Wu. Uh, basically, he had these bright line ideas of what you know the perfect internet ecosystem should be. And there were kind of these three big ideas, uh, blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization, which we can do a deeper dive on. Um, but basically, these are things that internet providers should not be doing to its customers. Um, there was never any evidence that they were or any sign that they showed or any incentive for them to do so. But he said that, that it should be uh, protected online. And in 2015, the Democrat-led FCC implemented um, these rules uh, under Title II of the Communications Act to codify uh, those principles, along with a lot of other regulatory uh, barriers to really make it a lot harder for uh, providers to help you know, consumers get connected and benefit um, from the Internet. So when the Republicans took the presidency and uh, the FCC, they worked tirelessly to unwind those regulations, um, which is, I think, the hysterics that you're alluding to, uh, where you had this incredible campaign of people saying that people would die, the Internet wouldn't work anymore, uh, tweets would load one word at a time, uh, you'd have to pay to use Twitter, um, you know, the, the craziest things. And, you know, it really reached a fever pitch to where the public officials and friends of mine who were working for the commission at the time uh, were receiving death threats. Um, I was personally evacuated from the FCC due to a bomb scare uh, when they were voting on it. And this, you know, this is you know, talking about bureaucratic regulation. We're not talking about any wow. fundamental change to society here. Um, well, so, so a few it, things that, 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 that's insane what you just uh, laid out. And, um, so, so you, so Jonathan, who's online with us right now, uh, with R Street, was with the FCC and was there uh, when they removed net neutrality, as he just described. And you hear all the, the as that's being removed and uh, disassembled in the bureaucratic state, uh, bomb threats and more. And uh, look, it just this part is me opining. It has nothing to do with uh, R Street, which is not Republican or Democrat. Um, this, to me, is how both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, can be guilty of just scaring the absolute hell out of people. Uh, and, and when every vote comes down to you're going to live or die, this is what happens. And Jonathan's laying this out. And, and again, Jonathan, the other part to this is how the power that the bureaucratic state in Washington, D.C. has now that, you know, it's like Congress has just abdicated responsibility after responsibility. They don't vote on major sort of infrastructure or policy type things anymore. And isn't this an example of the bureaucratic state making major changes just at a whim? Yeah, I mean, 100 percent. And the, the funny thing about this is that, you know, it was in 2015, it was in 2017 and nothing has changed today. It's an yeah. issue in search of a problem. Um and, you know, th there hasn't been an issue. It hasn't been an issue for years. And the fact that in 2023, you and I have to be talking about this again um, is frustrating in and of itself. 
um, you know, Congress could act to codify some of these bright line principles, which, you know, most of the carriers would be fine with. But instead, they're using the, you know, the phrase net neutrality really as a means of applying this utility style regulation over broadband. And it, it's really two separate conversations. And I think that the concern that I have, and along with a lot of my other contemporaries, is the fallout and the aftermath of what these heavy regulations could have um, as far as the internet ecosystem. And no, I don't think anyone's going to die, and I don't think planes are going to fall out of the sky, but it is concerning to think about how far internet come and how resilient it was, uh, especially during the pandemic, when more of us were online than ever before, that we want to turn around and go back to this heavy-handed regulatory framework. Without a doubt. Jonathan Cannon on the line with us right now. You can follow on Twitter, by the way, at JML Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N. And you find our street uh, online, uh, rstreet.org. Um, and again, the R Street Institute is a think tank. They uh, push for free markets and solutions. And um, net neutrality is not about freedom. It's about control. It's about uh, cumbersome regulation. With that said... Um, I just could you just reiterate again, like <clears throat> since they removed this, there has been uh, no one's died, <laughs> first of all, uh, but the Internet has more choices than ever. And there's been no cases of like price gouging or throttling. Right. I mean, the, the, the remarkable thing about Internet is it's it's not like a utility. It's not like, you know, you go to your tap and water comes out. I mean, it is a different product that does different things for different customers. Um, and you can go out and you can choose what you have in most cases. Um, and as you said, you know, the price of broadband, despite inflation, has gone down from what you're getting for your dollar. Um, very few other industries can say that, um, especially in our current economic climate. Um, speeds have increased 100 fold year to year. It's unbelievable seeing how much the landscape has changed. Yet, instead of looking forwards at all the success we've had, People are clinging on to, you know, old things because that's what they, you know, it's the hill they've chosen they have to die on. Yep. Yep. Uh, Jonathan, um, as we discuss this, uh, I'm totally going to put you on the spot here with a few things, uh, only because you're a friend of Shoshana, so I'm assuming you could take it. Uh, that accent of yours, what are you, from Jersey? Are you from New uh, York? I'm, I'm totally kidding, dude. <laughs> I don't know if you thought say, I was... I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, a Londoner by birth, but I did uh, live in Florida for eight years. Did you? Um, and I, yeah. Uh, so uh, in Boca Raton, and then my uh, I went to undergrad at UCF. So I oh, know a lot nice. of your listeners are in the Tampa area, but you know the the, the best school in Central Florida. <laughs> um, and and Jonathan, you know, so I'm, I'm looking at your Twitter here. By the way, you can follow Jonathan on Twitter uh, uh, at JML Cannon. Uh, English by birth, American by choice. Uh, are you a citizen? I am, yeah. So I naturalized uh, in 2014. Um, to this day, still one of my proudest moments. Why? Why? Why did you do that? Um, I had nothing better to do. No. <laughs> um, my family and I came over, um, and you know, not that England is, you know, one of these dystopian hellscapes, but you know, even for someone growing up there, there's just this idea of American exceptionalism, and it, you know, it really reflects just the the culture and the approach to how we as a country do things and have always done things. That's just so appealing. And, you know, not only did I move to the U S I now live in Washington um, and, you know, I engage in policy issues like the ones we're talking about today. And it's just, yeah, you know, it's hard to escape from it. Cause it's just, you know, it's so tantalizing to want to be part of the, you know, the great American experiment. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I'm sorry to get personal on you, but uh, I, I, I <laughs> no, love your no, answers. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, uh, I'm glad that we did. Um, so, th you know what? Uh, that said, uh, in wrapping this up, um, uh, we, we've gone through, again, net neutrality. For those of you just joining us, uh, we're laying out how the Biden administration is yet again kicking this around. By the way, if I may, again, take a sidestep here and get into some politics of this. Like, who in the hell? This, the fact that the Biden administration is doing this once again underscores how not only their administration is just so utterly incompetent, but the campaign side of the Biden uh, team is as well. Who thinks that this is a winning issue? You know, when we're dealing with freaking inflation, when we're still handing out billions of dollars 
uh, uh, to Ukraine, regardless of how anyone feels about whether or not we should be funding Ukraine. Like, Biden's going to throw in net neutrality? What kind of a decision is this? Uh, I come back to it's about control. It's, it's, I think that they're grasping as well, grasping at straws, anything that they can find to just sort of just get any tiny fraction of, of voters to get, get motivated about something. Uh, but it's desperate. It's about control. And it's overall just sad. Uh, Jonathan, anything else legislatively um, or within the bureaucrat state that uh, that you or those of you at R Street uh, are, are looking at or concerned about now? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of things. And if, if I can just quickly go back to something you said, please, um, you know, one of the things that I think is is damning about this issue is the administration when Biden first uh, you know entered the White House laid out what his platform was and said that net neutrality you know, was a priority of the administration. But it took them almost three years to find a fifth commissioner um, in the FCC. So they had a democratic mandate. So this issue clearly hasn't been a priority for them because they waited until the 11th hour to have the mandate to order to put this issue. And now they're going to try and steamroll this issue through, um, you know, right before an election. Um, so, you know, getting into the politics of the issue uh, more than the substance, but um it, it's concerning to see that it's you know kind of this rushed effort as opposed to a genuine cause of concern um you know talking about other issues that our street's been focusing on we've been looking a lot at the federal trade commission you know another uh agency that has just weaponized itself against a lot of you know large companies and tech companies um but the funny and ironic thing is when we're talking about net neutrality the federal trade commission is actually empowered to go after um, internet providers when they are engaged in these, you know, practices that would quote unquote harm consumers. There hasn't been any investigation or look into any of these companies for engaging in these behaviors. So again, it's it's you know looking for problems and solutions and not getting anywhere. Um, and it's it's just a real shame to see because there are genuine, as you said, uh, problems um, both you know in the tech front and otherwise. Yeah, without a doubt. A uh, huge thank you, Jonathan. A real pleasure to have you on. I appreciate uh, the depth, too, of, uh, you know, underscoring everything that's happening, what it means, and uh, and, and even kicking in uh, a little of the, the political aspects of this. Again, you can find Jonathan uh, on Twitter at JML Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N. And uh, R Street is a, a fantastic organization. Uh, we've had their their experts on for quite a few different issues, including occupational licensing and more. And uh, you can visit them at rstreet.org. Jonathan, thank you, bud. Till next time. Yeah, Trey, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. I'm Trey Radel. This is The Drive. We'll be right back.